Hey, I want to take a moment to tell you about Anchor. I absolutely love Anchor, and it's the easiest way to make a podcast. That's why I use it. Let me explain. It's completely free, and there's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will also distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and every other podcast platform out there. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Switch to Anchor and never pay a hosting fee again. What you need to do is download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Welcome to the 99% Loco Podcast. Hey there, podcast family. Welcome to another week of the podcast, and thank you for tuning in. This week brings us to episode number 55. Each episode, me, your host, Chris Green, is bringing stories of Nashville and Middle Tennessee-based entrepreneurs, business owners, authors, musicians, and other creators. Everybody has a story, their own unique upbringing, and a passion for why they're doing what they're doing. I personally love the sense of community around Nashville and get my kicks from sharing these stories. This week's guest is A.W. Miller. A.W. Miller is a father, husband, homesteader, author, and accomplished voice actor with over 37 titles to his credit, as well as providing a variety of voices for video games, commercials, apps, and more. Miller is also the Arts Clubs and Enrichment Director at Valor Collegiate Academies in Nashville. Miller started out in radio, where he wrote, produced, and voiced well over 500 radio spots before honing his voice for TV, film, and web. A.W. Miller loves telling stories and always has, partly because he believes that there's something intrinsically human about storytelling, and partly because he just loves stories. Did you hear I mentioned he's an author too? Yes, Miller released his first full-length novel in November 2020, which he would call an urban fantasy novel. You can find a link to that in the episode notes. Miller currently resides in Manchester, Tennessee with his wife and two of their eight children. So let's get right into this. Here's my conversation with A.W. Miller, professional voice actor and storyteller. Man, you're a busy person. <laughs> <laughs> I can't not be busy. So let me let me try to get some of your titles down here and you can fill in some gaps. So, you know, you're a voice actor, you're an acting coach, you're a director of arts clubs and enrichment at Valor Collegiate Academies. You also are writing, producing, and voicing within podcasts. Um, you've done over 500 radio spots, written, produced, and voiced, over 30 audiobooks. You've done TV, games, apps. I published a book also. That's right. You publish a novel. So, wow, you're a voice actor, you're a writer. <laughs> like I said, busy, busy guy and yeah. talented guy. So, well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Before we dig into this and I want to dissect all of those things, can you just kind of tell me your story and, you know, growing up and what eventually led you to doing what you're doing today? Wow. That is a involved question. I'll do the best I can to give a short answer. Um, I am originally from Wisconsin and If you met my parents, you would immediately assume I was adopted. They're just completely different. They have their own creativity, but not a lot of action on that level. And I made the decision early on that I was just going to be a a storyteller. Like everything I do is comes from that straight up storyteller. So whether that's podcasting, filmmaking, writing books, producing, whatever, that's, that's where it comes from. And, uh, I've just been doing that my whole life, um, and really enjoy it. I just really enjoy telling stories. Did you spend most of your life in Wisconsin? I spent 18 years uh, in Wisconsin, and then I served in the National Guard and Naval Reserves for a total of six years. Um, And then with my first wife, I moved to Minnesota. Then that didn't work out, moved to Tennessee. And that's where I am now with the wife I'm supposed to be with. So I live in Tennessee, middle Tennessee, actually. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice how that works out, right? 
Right. <laughs> so is that, I mean, did, is the, is the marriage what brought you down here or, you know, was there I, something else? No, actually I, um, I used to write, I was the creative services director for a radio station in, in Knoxville. So I got hired to go to this station in Knoxville. B97.5 was one of them. Um, there were four other stations in that cluster. So that's what brought me to Tennessee. And then I met my wife and then we, after we married and moved from Knoxville to Manchester, um, where we live now. Manchester. Yes. Bonnaroo's in Manchester. Also known, yeah. Right? Also known as Bonnaroo. Right. Right. Yeah. And I think, uh, one of my favorite, uh, parks is there. Old Stone Fort. Yes. It's gorgeous. Absolutely. It's a great walk. Yes. Yes, it is. That's, that's one of my favorite places to go. Just the, you know, the, the little waterfalls there and yeah, you could spend, you could spend the day there, but just a side, uh, tangent there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you know what, how, how did you get into, you know, voice acting or realize that that's something that you had a talent for? I mean, what, did you just start doing funny voices when you were a kid and, you know, tell me about that. It's a two part story. So yes, to to your question. Yes. I I have enjoyed doing voices my whole life. Um, and I worked in radio for eight years at at a couple of different stations back in Wisconsin and here in, in Tennessee. And then I, I became a teacher. I was a teacher for full-time teacher, English, creative writing, uh, theater, uh, broadcast journalism, filmmaking. Um, and about, now it's been nine years, my wife said, you need a hobby. Have you ever thought about narrating audiobooks? I said, no, I didn't know that I could do that. That's cool. So we did a lot of research, got it a closet, treated it with uh, acoustic foam. And I've been doing that ever since. And last year with the pandemic, um, really kind of paved the way for me to do more of this um, voice work. And I, I totally enjoy it. It is right in my wheelhouse of acting and performing and creating. And then my son and daughter also, who are performers, they've done a lot of stage. Um, they they do voice work for um, a couple of things. My son does some online comics, but we all, all three of us do a um, comedy Western, a scripted comedy Western podcast. Yeah. And you know, what's funny is you, you had told me early on when we were talking, it's called Alabaster Flats, right? Are you, are you still doing that? Yes, I am. And my wife is our producer and I, I'm going to get fired if I don't finish the next episode. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've been busy. I've been like, I pulled in nine directions and I, but I love doing it. It's a lot of fun. It's yeah. Nice and, second season. Yeah. And you know what? I, I'm not going to lie. I, I heard about it somehow before you know, you and I even connected, Oh wow! Um, which is really weird. So I don't know if weird. maybe, maybe I found it over social media. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I started listening to it. I want to listen to more, you know, it's kind Thank of, you. uh, it's kind of a, uh, change of pace than your, you know, regular podcasts you listen to, you know? Yeah. So, um, you know, what really intrigued me about you, you know, I kind of started looking through some of the, your demo reels and whatnot, but you do such a wide variety of <laughs> voices and characters. Oh, thank you. Um, it, it's kind of crazy. Cause usually when you think of a voice actor, you just think of, you know, the woman that does Siri or, or, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. but you've done, you've done all kinds of things. You've done accents, you do, um, it's just crazy. I mean, I was I was looking like all the looking at all the audiobooks and things you've done too. I mean, you've done fiction, children's books, I think even some gardening books. I you are um, correct. You've done your research. Yeah. To yeah. You. yeah. <laughs> I uh I enjoy as long as it's creative, I I'll try it. I I yeah, I've so I've done I it's like 35 plus books. I love doing the books that have a variety of characters. One of my favorites that I've done recently is by Michael C. Bauman. Love the guy. He's fantastic. Um, we've been friends now for a year. And I did his book, Venom Wars of the Desert Realm. And I think that holds the record for the most characters I've ever done in a single book, which is like, I want to say it was 22, 24. I lost count. Uh, individual characters, individual voices. Yeah, I mean, I didn't even think of that. Where well, you're right. If you're doing a book like that, you know, you're the one that's doing all those characters typically. Wow. You are. Wow, yeah, with that's... an audiobook, you are so depending on the book, you you know, you're now some authors are like, no, I don't want any characters. So I, I I've not worked with any of those. So I like doing the ones where I can do a narrator narrator voice 
but then lend myself to doing a various other characters, um, whether that's young adult fiction, like Mike's book, or um, I had a chance to do a vampire novel where there were some characters from Britain and, and a, a Russian vampire. And um, there was like, I did like four different characters in the same scene. That was, that was very challenging, but I love doing it. So. Yeah. Is there, is there anything like that, any ads or anything that's played through middle Tennessee that anyone would have heard you on? Not, no, probably not now. Back in Knoxville, uh, when I worked uh, at uh, South Central Communications, probably, they probably would have heard me if they were listening to any of those four or five radio stations. But I don't do anything local. Um, the agents I have, they're outside of middle, I have one agent in middle Tennessee, and then I have a handful that are outside of that. So um, a lot of what I've been booking lately is like explainer videos you might see online. Um, I did one for Goat Tools a while back. Um, so you won't really hear anything locally from me. Unless you listen to yeah. the podcast. Yeah, gotcha. Uh, you mentioned agents. I mean, how... I want to know a lot more about the process, you know, of how, you know, you actually get work. And um, I'm guessing yeah. it's through these agents and they help you find work. I mean, is there... I was doing a little more research, but is there an actual audition process as well when you when you get voiceover work? Yes. Um, so there are there are a handful of ways that you can book work. One of the most immediate ways is through what's called a pay-to-play, a P2P. Um, and it's sort of like subscribing to a newspaper where there are exclusive job offers specific to your content area, like wherever you work. So in this case, it's voiceover. So you you subscribe to these things. Some people frown on them. You know, I, I've had some success with them. That's one way to do it. And there are, there are some very expensive ones. And then there are some free ones. Uh, and in either case, you get what you pay for. So there's that realm of commercial voice work, video game voice work. Then there's the whole world of agents and getting an agent takes time, right? It, I mean, I've been doing this for eight years. I just signed with agents last year um, and then two this year. So it, it's a process and you have to have a professionally produced demo. You really need to have training. You, you can't just show up and say, somebody said I have a great voice. I'd like to do voiceover. It, it's, it's work. It's a lot of work. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, if not for the, the pressures of what the pandemic did, I probably would not have poured into it what I, what I have poured into it. And it's been very successful for me. Well, good. I was going to ask you, you know, what some of the keys to marketing yourself are. I think you mentioned some there. I mean, w what else is there? I mean, there's, I'm sure there's a ton of people who, um, you know, want to get into voiceover work or think they can do it. But um, I would say you know, the, the first, absolutely positively, there's two things that like, it's like 1.1 and 1.2. You have to have a decent space. Like you can't just pop at a Yeti microphone in your kitchen and think you're going to book anything. Um, <laughs> and then secondly is this to training. And so I, I also coach acting privately, but I can't, I'm, I'm terrible at coaching myself. Like I can't direct myself. <laughs> I can direct anybody else. I love doing it. I've been doing it for several years. Um, but I hired a coach and she was fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Basically was saying the same thing I would say to my students, but in a way that I could process and apply to my audition work, literally changed my approach to it. So those are the things that I think most important on the front end, got to get training, got to have a decent space. It's not about buying a $1,500 Neumann TLM 103, right? Super nice mic, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. very beautiful, but that's not going to book you work. Being able to do what's being booked right now is going to book you the work. So there's like, that's on the commercial side. Video games are a little different. Audiobooks are a little different. Um, I, and I'm, I, you know, I would have, be happy to field questions from listeners if they want to email me or, or reach out to me through my website. I love talking about it and love helping people, um, especially in middle Tennessee, um, where I have a little bit more immediate access to them. Yeah, absolutely. So do you have your own, uh, I'm guessing you have your own home studio where, which is where you do most of your work. I do. It's yeah. a closet um, that my wife and I were using basically as a junk room. <laughs> and so we gutted it, treated it with acoustic panels. Um, if you're going to do this yourself, you don't need a closet. Although I know a lot of voice actors who do because they use the clothing to um, mask the reflective surfaces. That's really what the big thing is, making sure you have no reflective surfaces so that as you are recording, you're not getting any slap back and you're not getting it. It doesn't sound like you're in a room that kind of thing. And there's a lot, there's a lot of the stuff that you can get now 
has come down in price. I mean, I think my personal opinion, not certainly based on anything I've done research on, but you could literally start a voice acting career for under $500, assuming you have a PC or Mac already. You really could. You could. Yeah. So like before all that recent technology of being able to do this at home, you know, even doing podcasting and stuff at home, you know, what what was that like prior to that? I mean, I would imagine you'd have to physically go to a, a studio somewhere and, and do it that way, right? Yes. So I, I never had that experience. Like everything I've done for the last eight years has been from home. I started in audiobooks um, and used the knowledge I had from working in radio to help put my studio together. But everything I did was in audiobooks. But if you were doing commercial voiceover pre-COVID, you you went to a studio. You auditioned at a studio um, and were there with everybody else. And, you know, or if you had an agency, you went to their, a lot of agents have their own studio or they, or they work with one. You would go there. Now that landscape has, has completely changed. Like home studio, all of the auditions I get say, VO must have home studio broadcast quality, which is a misnomer and mm. source connect. Um, there used to be uh, ISDN that's going away. ISDN is a bit of a dinosaur. Source Connect is what you want. Source Connect standard. Although some places will allow you to do Source Connect now, which is the free version. Uh, but I, but it's it's alarmingly easy now mm. to yeah. get into it. It's but it's the it's the training and being able to provide a voice that's booking right now. Like what's and you need to listen to that stuff. That's the I guess that would be like the third thing is like you got to know what's being booked. So you're not delivering something that isn't gonna get booked. You know, you mentioned the the you know the old standard ISDN. I'm familiar with that that communication standard. So what? Tell me more about that Source Connect. Is it just kind of an advanced form of uh, digital transmission, or, or what? What is that? It is put out by a company called Source Elements, and they're fantastic. By the way, I had a little bit of a connection issue. Reached out to their troubleshooting team, and and they fixed everything. It was fantastic. Um, you can, you can, there's three versions of Source Connect, uh, all of which are, it's very similar to the concept of ISDN, mm-hmm. but it's, it's local based. Like I have a little piece of software, I double click it, open it up, there's my Source Connect. I can open it up in my DAW and um, I can record locally while the engineer, uh, the sound engineer records in his or her studio. Um, so you can do Source Connect now, which is browser based, not as good, by the way. Uh, we had a little bit of issue with that. And then you can do Source Connect now standard. It's 35 bucks a month. Or you can do Source Connect Pro. I would, you don't need Pro if you're a a solo voice actor. If you're a studio, you might need it. Um, But the concept is the same. It's it's like ISDN. It's a direct connection. They record on their end. You record a local copy just in case something goes down. And um, it's broadcast quality. It's 48 um, KHC. Is that like what a lot of the... uh you know, a lot of the radio broadcasters and whatnot switch to remote, you know, recording, especially over COVID. Is that what they're using? Or I don't, That's a good question. I don't yeah. know what radio okay. is using. That's fair. Do you know a lot of <laughs> studios will, will ask, like every audition I get must have either a Source Connect or I don't see a lot of ISDN. It's just, it's just going away. Um, Source Connect is where it's at. <laughs> Well, cool. Yeah. We geeked out a little bit there on that stuff. <laughs> Hope we didn't lose any listeners. <laughs> or we just generated but more questions. Th- that's true. Um, you know, tell me, tell me about these auditions, like what goes into them. I mean, is it, I, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> like what, what kind of prep works involves, like when you get a lead on something and you're auditioning for it? Sure. Um, so you know, you get an age range. Um, so I turned 50 this year, but I think I can, I can skew down to about 35 and then I can skew a little older depending on what they need. Um, you look over the copy, sometimes it's straight commercial copy. It could be announcer or it could be real person, but specifically related to a product, or it could be explainer video. It could be, um, promo stuff. You have, you know, you have to know who your audience is and what you're delivering to them. Um, so I get a piece of copy. I come into my studio. Um, there are two questions I ask myself before I record. Actually, three. The first question is, is this announcer copy or is this real person copy? And then there's two different approaches for those things. Um, and that's that's for that kind of work. Video game is different. So video game is, you look at the specs that they're listing for you. 
what kind of character, what accent are you going to be doing? Um, and then being able to deliver not just what's there. Like there, that's a, here's a huge secret for anybody who's listening, who's thinking, I want to be a voice actor. If you just give them what they list, you aren't going to book anything. It just isn't going to happen because secretly what they're hoping for is to be surprised. And, and the same is true for commercial copy. First take is there, second take is yours. Audiobooks is a little different. Uh, no, it's not a little different. It's a lot different. Like audiobook, here's the book. <laughs> you, you, you can't deviate <laughs> from that, right? Right, right. Um, audiobooks is a whole beast in itself because there's, there's the technical side of it. Like with commercials, I can just record it, engineer picks it up, they take care of it. I don't have to worry about it. Most of the time, audiobooks, um, I, I edit all my stuff myself, edit and master it myself. Uh, a, because I'm anal retentive about it and I, I know what I need it to sound like. But B, I, I can't afford to pay $50 to $100 per finished hour for someone to edit it. And then that's taking a third or half of what I'm making off of an audiobook. Do most... Uh voice actors do their own editing or is it just depend on their skill set? And like you, like you mentioned, you know, your budget to be able to pay someone to do that. Um, I would say depends on skill set. You know, okay. people new to an audio book may not realize how much there is. Right. So, so it, it, one hour of finished audio can take a new person, brand new, never done it before up to six hours, right? One hour. Typically, as you get better at it, that becomes a two to one, maybe a two and a half to one ratio where what you're narrating. So a 15 minute chapter technically is going to take you 30 to 45 minutes voicing and editing and mastering. So as you're planning this out, like if somebody said, hey, I'm going to make money off of audiobooks. But no, you're not. You're not going to make a dollar off of audiobooks. It takes a long time. It's really easy to get into. You literally this tonight. You could go to Walmart, buy a Blue Yeti. I don't recommend those. They're USB mics. They tend to have a lot of self noise. Right. Get under a blanket and you could start working through um, Audible or a Amazon's ACX and, and start narrating audiobooks. You really could. But you're only probably going to book royalty share. Royalty share means you're doing a whole bunch of work on the front end and not getting paid until the book starts to sell. Um, but you really literally could do that tonight. Um, that's sure. how it happened for me. I, like over a weekend, I was like, cool. I set up my profile. I'm auditioning. That's how fast it can happen. You know, you mentioned the video games. Um, you voiced, uh, at least one character. I think you've done more. Tell me about that. And, you know, I'm, I'm guessing that's a little bit different than obviously doing an audio book or just a, a radio spot or something. For sure. I mean, it is. Yeah. Different, yeah. Um, I, uh, my claim to fame right now is voicing the character of Lomo in, uh, a game by Ion Lands called Cloudpunk. It was released on all platforms. Uh, now it's available on all platforms and they're going to be releasing, um, they, they say it's DLC, but it's not really, it's almost a sequel. And so I got to voice uh, a couple of new characters in that as well. Absolutely loved it. I, that is, I love doing characters more than I love doing anything else because there's so few limitations. Like when you're narrating something, you have to follow the narrative arc and then you have to do the dialogue for whatever characters. But a lot of times with video game, there's a lot more improv that can happen um, with those. So Cloudpunk's probably the most visible title I've done. I've also done a, um, the name of the character is William Blanco in a game by Psycho Dev called Chronicles of Innsmouth, Mountains of Madness. Um, and there's one other video game that hasn't been released. So I, I don't, I'm not under, I'm not under an NDA to be able to not talk about it. I just don't know enough about it from the client because they've been like, we aren't going to release it. So we can't tell you anything. You know, you're a director of arts clubs in enrichment at Valor. Um, Valor's a, it's like a college prep charter school, right? Or yes. Yes. yeah. Um, in Nashville. Um, what are you, what are you doing there and how long you've been doing that? I um, started there last July and absolutely love it. It is an absolutely amazing place to work. And, and I'm not getting paid to endorse this. I've, I've worked in public education for 15 years as a classroom teacher and getting moving into Valor as the director of fine arts and enrichment has been absolutely life-changing. The people there are phenomenal to work with. It is not like any place I've ever worked for in my entire life. And this position that I was hired for was created because they saw a need to, to bring fine arts and enrichment under one umbrella. And it's really been my dream job to be able to work with teachers to help them 
become better teachers within that content area, theater, art. Um, and in Valor's case, we also have PE and what's called Compass. Um, but it's, it's a dream job. I'm, I'm not going to lie. And uh, it's, it's been great. And oddly enough, coaching a teacher, coaching teachers to, to improve them in their craft, help them improve their craft, is a lot like coaching actors. So it's almost as if uh, everything I went through to get here has prepared me to, to be able to give this to them. Um, and, and I love it. I love doing it. Um, you know, one thing I didn't mention is I think you've actually done some acting as well, right? <laughs> have, you, yes. have you? And, you know, it's funny as usually it's kind of, uh, you know, those guys in radio and doing voices and podcasts, you know, it's kind of face face for radio thing. But no, you're on screen, too. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, I've been on stage. Um, I've played a few characters. I had the luxury of luxury, actually joy of playing opposite my son, um, in Peter and the star catcher. I've also directed, written and directed four films, uh, short films, and I get to play opposite my son. in one of those, um, I haven't gotten to be in a film with my daughter yet, but I've directed her in a film, uh, written and directed one, two films with her and my son uh, done some stage work. Uh, but I love doing it. It's really like, being able to be in my booth acting on the stage acting or on camera acting. I just, it's all of it. It's just, it fuels me tremendously. Yeah. And as if that wasn't enough, you put out a novel last year. Yeah. I had nothing better to do. Um, just kidding. Really? That book has been, it took me 15 <laughs> years. This is, um, so I started oh, wow. that book. Yeah. 15 years ago, inspired by my wife and it went through several drafts and I thought, yay, I'm going to be a, you know, big author. I sent it off to some agents and all of them rejected it, except for one who said, great idea, but it can't sustain itself in its current form. Have you thought about doing this? And I took her suggestion, completely rewrote it. And in its final form, it was like 450 pages. And I thought, I'm never going to get the whole thing published. What if I just release it in sections? So mm -hmm. I taught my, my wife and I, we hired an editor and, um, I, uh, I was good. I, I designed the cover because I, you know, we're, you got to stay under a budget. So it's like easier for me to design it myself. Um, and then I took that 450 page monster and split it into three different parts and published book one. So, so what's, what is book one about, or what is this series about? Can you tell me? I absolutely, uh, book one is called ocean salt. Um, the Allegai. and Allegai is Greek for transfer, transformation, metamorphosis. Um, the, the main character is a woman named Laurel Nash, who is the daughter of a Coast Guardsman who, right before the book, a year before the book begins, he dies. Um, she falls into a bit of alcoholism, deals with that, and decides to take her father's trip to Greece. Unbeknownst to her, she ends up in Olympus and falls in love with Poseidon, who, at the beginning of the book, dies. And from there, she must unravel a mystery that is centuries old to try to put things back together and save both Olympus and earth. That is, there's my elevator pitch. Yeah. Yeah. How many, how many books are you planning then that makes up the whole, uh, the series? Two more in this. And then, so this series, yeah. So three books in this series and then part two, uh, which has not yet been written, but is in my head, certainly finished in my head, um, may come about, um, uh, We'll see. It took me 15 years to get this far. And I've done a terrible job of marketing this book. I, I have not, I have, I got too many irons in the fire. So I, I need to, maybe this podcast will do it. I, <laughs> yeah. I would, I will, uh, if I would give a book away to one of your listeners, if they like reached, I don't know, like the, the 100th person to, to n like name your podcast or you can figure it out. We'll do something. Sure. I'd be happy sure. to give a book away. Awesome. Yeah, we'll make that happen. And I'll help promote it too when we uh, Sweet. get your episode out. So um, I sense a, a sci-fi fantasy theme in a lot of the work you do. Yeah, um, absolutely. <laughs> uh, Robert Jordan, Tad Williams, um, Robert McCammon, Stephen King. So, you know, a lot of those few. But also like on the other side of it, there's John Steinbeck, um, probably yeah. my favorite author of all time. So all yeah. those things kind of fall into my head. Um Huge fan of King's Dark Tower series. Just finished that, actually. Um, the seven-book seven monster that it was. Uh, but yeah, for sure. 
love Greek mythology. My son, even more so, he's, he's, he's actually helped me with my research in putting the book together. Um, so yeah. Eight children, eight <laughs> children. <laughs> yeah. Yep. All adults. All adults. And you're, One, you're 50, you're 50. I you're am, not I that old. 50. No, I'm not. <laughs> turned 50 this year. Um, don't feel 50. Love it. Um, and, and my son turned 18 this year, which, so this is a crazy little side thing. My wife turned 50 a year ago and my daughter turned 18 the same year. So mm-hmm. somehow inexplicably the, the two women in my life both had to get to share that and enjoy that. So my son and I get to enjoy that too. So that was nice. Great. Nice. So I turned 40 this year, so I'm 10 years behind you, but that's okay. <laughs> you, you, you still remember the eighties a little bit. Like I'm, I'm a child of the, for sure. A child yeah. of the eighties. Yeah. I remember the later eighties anyway. <laughs> mm. Well, cool. Hey, is there, is there anything else? Um, I'm sure there's some things going on in your mind, um, that would be worth sharing, but, uh, you know, I, I specifically had a ton of questions that you've answered for me regarding what goes into a lot of the, you know, voice work and things you, you do. So, um, I don't know if there's anything else you want to share. Uh, I would say, I mean, if you need a book narrated, private acting lessons, um, writing, I do that too. Um, or I do design work too. My wife and I, I don't even know. I don't know if you know this. We started a design business called Happy Hearts Designs. Um, and, and we design t-shirts. And so we have original t-shirts that are out there. Um, nice. Which we, no, I just, we we're lazy. We don't promote it very, very well. Um, <laughs> well, you got a lot going on. <laughs> we do. Yeah. Like, I mean, if, we also have a farm, like we have a five acre homestead. Yeah. Um, we raise chickens and cows, um, soon pigs uh, on, on our homestead. So yeah, we're, we're busy people, love doing it, love being involved. I love helping people, creative people who may be stuck, uh, especially when it comes to acting. And, uh, I just, that is one of my favorite things to do is cause I, a few years ago, I went and got Meister training coat. Let me, let me stop that train of thought for a second. I got trained on how to coach actors in Meisner, um, and absolutely love doing it and, and welcome any questions about that from any of your listeners to be able to help people out. I just, I'm love helping people. Yeah, on a side note, so is Meisner, that's kind of a, a technique or an approach to, to acting? Yes. Or, okay. Yep. Sanford right. Meisner, um, pe- people sometimes confuse his with Strasberg. Lee Strasberg did method acting, which is a completely different, although still based in Stanislavski, than Sanford Meisner. And, and sure. I've, just, I've adapted it for my own purposes anyway, so I, I approach it a little differently than, than uh, Mr. Meisner might have. Sure. Sure. Well, most importantly, you, you know, as we wrap up here, tell the listeners how they can find out more about you or get a hold of you if they had did have questions or, you know, maybe had something they, they wanted you to, to work on for them. For sure. Uh, easiest way is to go to my website, which is millersvoice.dramedyacting.com. That's probably the easiest. If you don't remember that one, dramedyacting.com is my uh, acting coaching site. And my email address is millersvoice at dramedyacting.com. I would love to hear from anybody. I'm happy to answer any questions, point you in the right direction if I can. Well, there you go. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. As always, thank you for listening. If you'd like to get a hold of me, I'd love to hear from you. You can email me directly at 99%localpod at gmail.com. Or you can actually drop by the contact page on the website and send a voice message that may appear in a future episode. You can find the website at 99%localpod. Dot com. While you're there, make sure you catch up on all of those past episodes that you might have missed. If you'd like to support the show, you can do it in a few different ways. Please follow the podcast on Instagram and Facebook at 99% Local Pod. Leave a review wherever you listen to the podcast. And the best thing you can possibly do is share the podcast with your friends who might want to check it out. Lastly, consider contributing to the podcast on a one-time or ongoing basis. All contributions that I receive, 10% of that goes to the Well Outreach Food Pantry in Spring Hill, Tennessee. Well, until next week, stay safe and be kind to those around you.